the people of sake actually brought me into sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history. And Welcome and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Sake on Air, the bi-weekly podcast broadcasting from the Japan Sake and Shochu Information Center here in Tokyo, where we bring you the stories, people, and discussions on the world of sake, shochu, and awamori here from the front lines of the industry. My name is Justin Potts, one of your regular co-hosts here on the show, and this week I'm joined by Mr. Sebastian Lemoyne. Together, the two of us sit down to chat with a Mr. Keith Norum. For those keeping tabs on the sake world, Keith likely needs little to no introduction. Keith is a longtime veteran at Miyasaka Brewing Company based in Suwa City of Nagano Prefecture in central Japan. While the name Miyasaka may not ring a bell for everyone, it's possible that if you're sipping on sake, that the name Masumi, the internationally renowned line of sake that they produce, likely hits much closer to home. Keith, being the knowledgeable and eloquent speaker that he is, I think it is in probably our listeners' best interest that we just dive straight into the interview. But real quick before we get started, just a couple of things. First, at one point, we suddenly start discussing a number seven. This number seven, or nanago as they say in Japanese, refers to Japan's Brewing Association Yeast Number no. Seven. This is a yeast strain that was extracted from the Masumi Brewery back in the 1940s, which has since gone on to become the yeast that has dominated sake production throughout Japan and abroad ever since. The rest of the details I'll go ahead and leave up to Keith. And second, a couple of times throughout the show we mention a mysterious person by the name of Natsuki. Who we're referring to here is none other than Miss Natsuki Kikuya. London's Sake All-Star, founder of the Museum of Sake, and Sake Curriculum Developer and Educator for WSET. The reason that her name comes up periodically is because we actually had Keith and Natsuki in the studio together for both back-to-back as well as a bit of a joint interview. What this means is that, you guessed it, there will be an interview with Natsuki hitting the airwaves here in the very near future. You may get to hear a little bit more from Keith at that time as well. And lastly, A bit of an announcement. We will be back at Aoyama Sake Flea, the fantastic celebration of sake and sake culture that takes place in Omote Sando here in Tokyo, together as part of the farmer's market held at the United Nations University. We were thrilled to be able to take part this past autumn, and we're very excited to be invited back on March 30th and 31st. We will be trying out an all-new format uh, with all-new guests, It's sure to be a great time, so if anyone is in the area, please do stop by and say hello. This interview with Keith has actually been collecting dust in our archives for a little while, so we're very excited to finally send it out into the world. We hope you all enjoy listening to it as much as we did conducting it. So with that, pour yourself a cold or warm glass of sake or shochu, and let's get to it. So why don't you take a quick moment, and why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Oh, okay. tell everybody, right. I said I introduced you real quick there, but uh, in a little <laughs> okay. bit more detail, who are you and where did you come from and why are you here? Well, my name is Keith Norum and uh, I'm, I'm from the United States. I was born in California, we lo- moved around, grew up in Appalachia in West Virginia, all country road, almost heaven, all that. Moved back to California, spent some time on the West Coast and... Then after that, moved to Japan a long time ago. Again, 28 years ago, I uh, landed on Japanese shores. Uh, At the time, I had absolutely no clue about sake, was not related to the sake industry. Um, I came to sake after I got to Japan. Uh, So again, one of those lucky, lucky things that happens. So did you come to sake or did sake come to you? You know, I think sake came to me. Um, I was not on a search for something like sake. Um, when I moved to Japan, I knew of sake in the way that a lot of people who are, you know, not from Japan know sake. You know, maybe you bump into it at some sushi shop that your brother hauled you into or something like that. Um, but that was a long time ago before anybody really was exporting uh, well-made, beautiful sake in a careful way. Uh, so I really 
I didn't even really think about sake till I got to Japan. And then I thought about it almost instantly a lot more. Uh, because that's when I realized that, wow, this stuff actually tastes good and it's different. Everything, every sake I had once I got here had its own character. Uh, and I realized that whatever I'd had back in the States was, was not the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was there a particular standout experience for you? Something that you remember you had a sip or you had a chat with somebody and you went, yeah, you know, what is this? It just kind of opened your eyes to... Yeah, possibilities? The, yeah, the, there is. It's a great question because you don't really generally go back and sort of look over things like that unless somebody asks a question. And it really was, uh, once I got to Japan, um, I, very, I, I arrived in Shizuoka uh, and then moved up to where I live now in Nagano uh, pretty quickly. It was maybe a matter of months that I moved to Nagano. I started working for a big company that's based up in, in the area that we're in. And... Uh, very quickly after you get hired by a company in Japan, uh, they take you out to dinner. It's one of those things you do. And so we went and had this big dinner party, you know, sort of a get to know each other thing. And a lot of sake came out. First beer came out, typically. As it usually does. As it usually does. This is a typical, you know, Japanese company thing to do. Everybody starts with beer and then sake kind of starts to appear on the table. And it was so different. It was so much better than what I'd had years ago in the States uh, that at first I was just, I was astounded. I was also surprised to see that nobody was going, oh, this is wonderful, lovely, you know, and they were just having it like water, like every day, this is just around, right? But for me, it was, it was an eye-opener. Uh, and I said, wow, this stuff is amazing. What is this? Oh, uh, I think this, maybe this is Masumi, uh, might be Yokobue, kana. And they're talking about the local sake makers in our area. Uh, and for them, it was like, yeah, okay. It's sort of like having a bud after work or something. Uh, but for me, it was, so there's that much difference between what we used to experience outside of Japan with sake and what people here in the local area uh, are experiencing. So I think that was a big moment for me. Yeah. And so to give our listeners just a little point of reference, so you are located in Nagano, there you go. on yeah, Lake Suwa, and, you have, exactly. and you have a handful of producers right there in your neighborhood. Exactly. And you exactly. work for Masumi now. Yeah, sorry right. about that. Right. I no, got that's off okay. track there. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Miyasaka Sake Brewery. What's exactly. the official English title? Yeah, yeah, it's the Miyasaka Brewing Company. Brewing Company, okay. Yes. Miyasaka Brewing Company, mm -hmm. who makes Masumi, which is probably yes. what most people would know. Exactly. Our brand is Masumi. That's our main brand. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a second brand called Miyasaka. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so basically, uh, we're Masumi. And so, <laughs> do you spend a lot of time in the brewery? You know, I spend less time than I want to in the brewery because I'm not supposed to be doing that part of the yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to be on my computer communicating yeah, yeah, yeah. with the world and things. How many, how many days a year are you traveling? You know, every year it changes, and I have never actually sat down and added up the days in a year. I've never done it. And I keep saying, one of these days I'm going to take a full year and add it up and see how many days it is. But I haven't done it yet. So guessing-wise, um, let's see, March. Basically start traveling in March. Before that, people travel to us, mostly. So from December to March, it's better to stay because so many people want to come and experience everything. So, so no, so during the main part of the, the production season in the winter from December to March, um, it's better for me to be there because we have so many people from so many levels of the industry that want to come in. Some are just one day trippers. And you can do that from Tokyo to Suwa and back in one day is no problem. And some people want to stay for several days. They want to be there every day in the brewery. And we warn them if they do that, then we put them to work. I mean, you can't just sort of stand around and look at your iPhone all day. If you're going to be in the brewery for a week or something, we'll get you to haul rice and wash rice and, and get in there and mix koji and do all that stuff. And most of them, that's what they want to do anyway. So, so that period, December, March, is no travel for me. It's also a really rotten time to try to travel into any place except around the equator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. But uh, from March, I travel every, pretty much every month. And generally try to hit two locations per trip. And that usually takes about 10 days, let's say, um, to do that 
over, you know, let's say average. So if we add it up, then that's one third of your time. Sorry, yeah, mm. yeah. So it's like ten. So let's say ten days a month from March to November. Mm. So how many days does that end up being? What? That's uh, about a ni- ninety days. A third of the year for so most of the year. <laughs> yeah, something <laughs> so like put that. all together a quarter of the year. Yeah. You're out running around someplace. Yeah. So I guess it's around whatever that is. Um, so getting back to what you're talking about, having all the people come to visit you in oh, the winter. Right, right. Yeah. Are, yeah. So to what degree is Masami open to people who are coming to visit? Uh, for mm. example, are people who just want to wander in? Can they come in and taste or can they actually see the process? Or do you save those more detailed explanations and tours for people in the industry or have a mm-hmm. certain relationship with Masami. Exactly, uh, what, so yeah. what sorts of people are coming to the brewery? Yeah, just to let people know, um, we have a beautiful shop and it also has a kind of um, tasting salon. And so it's open 365 days a year. It's always open. And you can come in there anytime you want to and do some tasting and have a kind of look through the windows at our um, sort of inner courtyard slash garden. But we don't actually do formal tours of the brewery itself um, to the general public. It's the brewery in Sua. We have two breweries, but the one in Sua is the original brewery. And it's quite old. It's it's not built for showing people. And uh, so we have to limit it, unfortunately which is actually against the overall dream and ideal of the president. President Miyasaka would love to be able to have a brewery where you can bring people through on regular tours. Uh, But to do that, we would have to close down that brewery for at least a year, reform it structurally, set it up so it's possible to actually have people come through. Um, So not yet, but who knows? In the future, we'd love to do that. What we do now is basically, if we get a request from someone who's already a customer, say somebody who works at a restaurant out there somewhere, almost always we'll find a way to accommodate that. And um, it's just a matter of if if they're polite and well organized enough to warn us several months in advance that what they're thinking, and then we can deal with schedules and the master brewer has to approve and so on, if we have enough time to kind of work out those details, then we generally say yes. Uh, another thing that we do is I- if, if it's a sort of standardized and well-run educational purpose, um, we're all for it, and we'll find a way to allow people to come in. Uh, for example, John Gautner, yeah. uh, he's been bringing his professional level, level two course um, up to our brewery uh, pretty much every year f- for the time I've been there. Um, you know, for over 10 years. And it, sometimes his groups are very large, uh, nearly 30 people. Yeah. And so, you know, we work it out. We split people into two groups and, you know, go through uh, as we can. But, but that sort of thing is so important to what we do and, and to spread, you know, the word about sake and about Masumi. Uh, so we're open to that. Recently, there's been, in inside our company, uh, a kind of final reckoning with what you have to do to make sake tours part of your business. Um, Because, and this is a good thing, the interest in seeing inside the brewery has has grown so much in say the last eight, nine years that uh, now the company's gonna have to go, well, let's kind of figure out a, a format and a standardized price and kind of make it uh, an actual uh, sort of fixed tour schedule. That, uh, and the reason we're doing this partly is there are uh, more companies that do specialized Japan, Japan tours, that sort of thing. So they're doing it as a business, and they're bringing people through, and they're paying customers. It's part of their tour of Japan. And um, at that point, we have to kind of look at it as a business as well because we'll end up running out of days and running out of people. We actually did... Uh, oh, an okay. episode sort of talking mm-hmm. about sort of searching for sake in Japan and traveling and touring a bit. And you bring up a really important point is that a lot of the places that will, they, if you have some sort of a connection, yeah, uh, they're yeah. generally welcome to having you come out to visit. Mm-hmm. And what a lot of times ends up happening is you will end up getting half of the day of the toji <laughs> or the president or somebody you know in the midst of a really busy brewing season and yeah. schedule you will end up tasting five, 10, 15 different sakes, mm-hmm. and it's a 
lovely to have that type of care. Yeah. But these are really busy people. Yeah. And exactly. there are a lot of times these quote unquote tours or experiences are mm -hmm. not compensated in any way. Yeah. And a lot of I've as you're starting to see a shift to some breweries are going, okay, as you said, how do we turn this into a model that we can, because the people, a lot of times the people who are coming, mm -hmm. again, th they're selling this as part of their package, part of their program, exactly. and they're benefiting off of this, which yeah. they're a tour company, it makes sense, but uh, that hasn't gotten around to the <laughs> the brewery yeah. side yet. You know, right. It's part of right. the the common sense, I guess you could say, as to how to address these things on a, on exactly. a business and, level. Exactly, and there are some breweries that are doing it really well, and so there are models that we can, you know, we can kind of... Um, uh, work from uh, for our own brewery as we get closer to the point where our facilities are ready to accommodate that kind of thing and it's going to have to kind of be hand in hand um, probably from y next year we'll be able to offer special tours uh, not for people in the industry but people have made a special request to bring in a small group you know five or ten people at the most uh, and have a nice tasting and, and guided experience uh, and then Probably, I would say in the next five years or so, I think our company will be looking at how to set up a brewery in a different way to, you know, make it more available to people, more accessible to people yeah. in that way. Have you seen a change at all in the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, maybe the literacy or the topics mm. of interest of the people that are coming to visit the brewery over the last Five years ago versus ten years ago? Or? Yeah, uh, in terms of people who are coming who've who are coming from overseas and who are specifically asking to be shown the brewery, definitely. Uh, and again, most of those people are people in the industry in some way. And uh, it, uh, it, it's just a, it's a particular sample. It's not sort of, I don't have any data on it, yeah. but, but the people who are asking that usually come with more knowledge than they did 10 years ago for sure. Yeah. And it's fun because a lot of times they have specific aims as well like they'll, they'll come in and say you know I really want to spend more time in the koji room because there's a bit of that I don't understand I really don't get it and I, I just want to be in there and sort of ask questions and sort of experience that so they'll even come with a focus in mind which is um, something that didn't happen uh, 10 you know 10 years ago yeah. at all and a lot of these people are also finding it uh, more of a what well, it's more of a profession than it used to be uh, before people would just sort of say, "Well, you know, we have a sake, you know, program on our I I in our restaurant, uh, and I ended up in charge of it, but I don't know anything about it, and so I'm going to try to educate myself and that sort of thing." Uh, whereas now we have people come in and say, "You know, I I'm from a restaurant that has a professional uh, sake sommelier, and uh, they're helping to kind of shape our program, and I'm learning more about sake." And now I want to learn more for my career, for my future. So they're actually seeing it as a career choice, that it, there's a direction there, and then it's going to develop into their career, uh, which is great to see. That's, that's fantastic. That's yeah. got to be, I mean, that has to be really exciting and a lot of fun as well to have mm -hmm. people who see that potential yeah. and, are, and yeah. are taking advantage of that in, in a positive way. Exactly. And I think, I mean, and, and talking about WSAT, I think having WSAT involved with uh, sort of, programs that are educating the, in a way that is is certifiable and certified and that give people confidence that if they spend the time and the resources they're actually going to have a career in that area uh, and and that helps grow sake uh, overseas anyway uh, similar things are happening in Japan but in a different way because Japan's sort of native soil for sake and it's a lot more complicated uh, yeah, here than overseas. In some ways, overseas is, is a clearer field. It's a little easier to do uh, things and see clear results from those things than in Japan. Yeah. So Digging into Masami a little bit more, mm -hmm. there are two things, just for me personally, that really stand out about it. Well, three things I get. Three, four. There are many things that stand <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> Once I start thinking, <laughs> all, all these things start popping up. But more the merrier. There's more, right? There's a lot. I say we've touched on a, on a couple, but a couple things that really stand out. Ha having visited several times and having the pleasure, I said there are not. I, whenever I've been able to visit and come with groups and things like that, there are not very many Keiths out there. Uh -huh. So 
you being there makes my life so much easier. Yeah, well, <laughs> and so it's glad, absolutely fantastic. And you do an incredible help. job. <laughs> um, glad to help. And, and sort of having visited a couple times mm -hmm. um, and ha being lucky enough to have opportunities to visit different producers, a couple of things that have um, sort of stood out to me is, mm. and you mentioned it a, a moment ago, is you guys are at a very unique scale. I yeah. guess you could say. That's a good way to put it, yeah. A very, and, I, and I mean that in a, in a positive way, oh, in yeah. a very positive way. Yeah. It, when I say in terms of the level of production mm -hmm. and sort of the type of production and what you guys are doing, you have enough... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You have enough mm -hmm. influence. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. have enough uh, yeah. clout. You have enough resources in order to elbow your way into well about that don't ask you our know. president probably wouldn't say we have enough resources but well anyway. maybe not <laughs> that's okay he, he, he wouldn't be president if he exactly <laughs> um but you know in order to kind of elbow elbow your way into convenience stores in some places into that's relatively true. common mm -hmm. or well-known uh supermarket chains and things like that so you guys have a presence alongside some really, really large producers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in yep. places, you know, here in Japan. Yeah, um, in but you guys are, places, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but you are strategic areas, right? Yeah. Absolutely. But you are not a large producer, I would say, by any means. No, no, we're uh, on the we're scale of you know, yeah, some of the a few of them that are up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, but you have a lot more resources than they mm -hmm. say, quote unquote, craft or the small, small breweries that make right. up 80% of the market, but yeah. the yeah. manner in which you produce a lot of your sake is very much, you're in that craft realm, mm -hmm. but you, on a market level in Japan, you rub shoulders with the really, really big boys in a lot of those different, you know, markets. And true. so you're in a yeah. really yeah. unique setting. And mm -hmm. when I talk to a lot of different producers, a lot of people don't necessarily envy that setting mm -hmm. in a way. They say, yeah. they say God, that's got to be really really hard mm -hmm. right because you're neither massive right, you don't have the resources right. to battle exactly. up there yeah. but you don't yeah. always get the quote-unquote craft treatment I guess you could say that the, exactly. the market's looking for right I look at it from the outside and I feel like that's a in Japan as far as scale and size and production a lot of brewers there aren't very many brewers that's like the small small segment right of producers right. here in Japan right. I feel like there's a lot of opportunity there uh, mm -hmm. not just in production but is as far as uh, how working style mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. communications a lot of different things I feel like producers at that level or producers at that level working together are possibly in a position to, uh, to do a lot of really interesting things that the other two yeah. on the other two yeah. extremes aren't able to do what's, Justin that's sort of your that's very that's very true I mean uh, it's it's an enviable <laughs> position and an unenviable position at the same time in fact, one of the one of the things that our president Miyasaki-san said once to a, um, a reporter that was interviewing uh, him, the reporter asked him, "What's one of the hardest things about being the president of Masumi?" And he said, and he, he kind of paused for a while to think about it, and he said, "It's being president of Masumi." And the reporter said, "Well, what does that mean?" He says, "Well." We have a reputation. We, we we've won a lot of, of awards, and we we have you know you know a long history of being highly reviewed in that. So we have a traditional quality, and we have a brand that's strong. But we're also not really um, big enough to simply go out and dominate a segment of the market, and we're also not small enough and unknown enough to just go out and do anything we want, do crazy things. Yeah. Um, we have a reputation to maintain, but we also have to be innovative and do stuff that's outside what is normal now and make new things normal uh, in terms of having a product out there that people can enjoy and, and sort of start to, to look at sake in a different way. And he said, that's difficult. And so it's as exactly as you said, being in the middle in a way, because we are in the middle in terms of our size, in terms of um, our resources. Um, we have to keep finding ways to put out products that are at the peak of our craft. In other words, we have master brewers. We have three master brewers, and we have under them um, assistant master brewers. We have a lot of very well-trained people who are working with very experienced people uh, who really know what they're doing. And 
are able to to make some products that a smaller brewery just doesn't have the resources to to go for and a larger a much larger brewery doesn't have the sort of corporate philosophy to do uh, when you get the very large end their business model is totally totally different the way they've organized themselves is completely different and it just doesn't make sense to that level of brewery to do the sort of products that our master brewers can come up with um, so it is it's exciting at the same time it's kind of challenging because these days especially and, and this is we're talking about in Japan I think more than overseas at this point um, in the retail side of sake uh, the the really great retailers, the ones that really support sake and, 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 and provide a lot of knowledge and support behind the products, are able to source sake from tiny little breweries in the mountains. People have nobody ever heard of them and showcase them in Tokyo or in Osaka. And so you get these really interesting, wonderful, um, quirky sakes, things you've never seen before. It's a dynamic retail market for them, but... Masumi is a sort of well-established, well-regarded brand. And so there's less and less shelf space for brands like Masumi or Urakasumi or Dewazakura um, because more of that shelf space is taken, taken up by tiny little breweries here and there. So it's odd because we're not really competing with a tiny brewery directly, but in the end, in the market, we are. So we have to show that we can do something that's in some ways more crafty in order to get the customer to keep um, giving us a try. Uh, one thing that we found is the, the customers that come in and make selections now, they really do have the idea of craft and the sort of philosophy of craft or uh, this sort of thing is kind of behind how they make choices, much more than it was 10 years ago. And so if they see Masumi as sort of a very high quality but established brand, that on its own is enough to get them to walk to another part of the store to find something they've never seen before, for example. And it's tricky because what we don't want to do is downsize our organization until we become tiny. Yeah. And we want to keep reminding the consumer that craft is not about size scale. alone. Yeah. It's not about scale. It's about uh, the application of technique and philosophy over time uh, at toward uh, ever higher quality in whatever aim you have. Uh, you can aim for, say, sakis that are more acidic, sakis that have certain characteristics, um, sakis that are very difficult to, to, to pull off. Um, all of that can be part of craft, and you can do that at a scale that's the Masumi scale, for example. Our scale, by the way, right, right now we produce, um, let's say, 2 million bottles, regular wine size or sake size bottles a year which means we're middle size. That sounds like a lot of bottles, yeah. and it is. It gives us some um, flexibility. Mm -hmm. We can make some standard lines, and we have enough capacity to really get out there and do some things that are unheard of and put them out too. And it doesn't you know, kind of take up all of our resources to do that. But we have to do it. Yeah. We have to put out products that don't look or feel at all like the standard Masumi mm -hmm. Uh, flagship lines. For example, the last couple of years we've been experimenting with new ways to filter, you know, mm -hmm. uh, meaning um, shiboru in the sense that when you have your mash and it's finished fermenting, your very first filtration where you're trying to clarify that, uh, we, are, we put out a couple of products using a filtration system that almost nobody uses that doesn't move the mash through a filter. It brings the filter to the mash and we sort of filter in place from the center of the mash. And what that has done for us is allowed us to produce two products so far that are still retaining all that beautiful bubbly gas that you get during fermentation. So we're able to keep that and sequester it in the bottle. Uh, so it's slightly fizzy. It pops when you open the, when you open the bottle. Uh, and that kind of thing um, is what we have to keep doing more of, uh, finding new ways to, to branch out. Very interesting. Very interesting. So kind of getting to that doesn't tie specifically just to craft, but when you're talking about you know those small producers and having to communicate that, and as the market mm -hmm. really shifts to that local-driven, terroir-driven mm -hmm. um, sort of and we have concept, and, and we you guys local, absolutely right? So. right, and you guys have that, and then the other thing you guys mm -hmm. have, and this is sort of the the big, not the elephant in the room, but the uh, 
the big magical number seven. Oh, okay. We yeah. can't talk about Masami without bringing up Absolutely. number seven. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm glad you did. Uh, at the beginning of this, I didn't bring it up when I talked about the things that I tell, for example, um, yeah, the staff of a restaurant mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in the world. I don't bring up number seven in that first, say, you have two or three seconds with your restaurant customer because it's a microbe. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's a you microbe. You can't see it. <laughs> Customers <laughs> will not remember yeah. stuff you tell them about microbes. Yeah. And so it isn't the first thing that I want um, the server to, to kind of unload onto the customers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. by the way, the microbe involved with yeah. this product is, no, it doesn't, yeah. it just doesn't stick. Yeah. Well, um, there's a lot of those next level Exactly. Customers, the, the literacy around food is really booming exactly. right now. So, and so yeah, so Masumi uh, is the home of what became the uh, association number seven yeast. And uh, I'm sure that you'd be doing segments about the yeah. whole yeast program yeah. and that. But, uh, but yeah, number we seven is... There yet, uh, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah number seven was... Uh, was uh, let's say it was identified at Masumi. Uh, and the way that program works essentially is, uh, uh, and again, this is the tax ministry of Japan. They have a vested interest in improving the <laughs> quality and increasing the quantity of sake produced in Japan. So their um, Brewing Institute created a uh, wonderful um, national appraisal of sake, a competition, which allowed them to get all the sakes or most of them in one place in order to look for these special yeasts that might be operating in some of the some of the makers' um, facilities. And right after World War II, it was 1946. Uh, the World War II had just ended. And the Institute um, paid Masumi a visit because Masumi had been doing very well in the competitions prior to that. Very small at the time. Masumi at the time was number 10 of the 10 brewers in Suwa area. Mm. So we were the small little guy wow. on the block at that point. So definitely something special was happening in the brewery. And by then they had developed a pretty good way of um, singling out a yeast as special and worthy of a new number. It happened to be the number after Aramasa and number six. And so they just said, okay, that's the seventh one. That's number seven. And so to folks who are listening, number seven is significant because mm. now it makes up I always forget numbers, but it, yeah, probably I about sixty percent something of, like that, yes. of the sake produced in Japan is now made with number yeah, seven. Exactly, yeast. and and you you think about it, the the yeast um, program ex uh, after that has expanded, and obviously there are a lot of yeasts that are not part of that numbered program. Um, these days, there are many companies that do nothing but develop yeast, uh, yeah. and there are makers that develop their own proprietary yeast and then make them available. So when you consider the number of yeasts that are available for sake makers, um, number seven clearly uh, is still the most commonly used sake yeast in the world, uh, which is pretty amazing. And, and not just in Japan. Obviously, the very largest makers, um, when they started making sake in, for example, California, uh, they, without question, started with number seven. And almost all of the sake that's produced um, overseas is is number seven a bit of nine and then of course craft brewers are now uh, very small brewers and and brewers that are focusing on you know single region telwar type sakes are are coming up with different yeast and different combinations but still number seven has been the workhorse uh, these past 70 years for really. the entire industry for the entire industry yeah. and just real quick how would you characterize number seven what is it that makes number seven special then uh, I think there are two things. Uh, one, one thing is something that anybody who's having a sake will be able to recognize. And the other thing is something that more the people who make sake recognize. The thing that anybody who has sake in their cup or glass, um, they'll recognize number seven because the aroma is not too overbearing with fruit. And uh, it produces a lovely aroma that some people catch banana, for example. And banana is a fairly round, kind of sweet, fruit-like um, essence. It's not a super bright, super intense fruit um, aromatic. So it has kind of mildly fruit-like characteristics in the aroma, but also characteristics that don't come from the fruit world. You, you've got some of the earth world as well. You've got a bit of bamboo. You've got um, maybe you've got greenness in the aroma as well. So you have these more 
natural earth-like um, tendencies in the aroma. And then that leads you into a flavor that doesn't, it, it doesn't disappoint. So you get an aroma that leads you into a profile that has integrity with what you already got from the aroma. Uh, so you're going to get, you're going to get balance. You're going to get um, earthy elements. You're going to get some sweet, depending on how you deal with it. Uh, but you're going to get something that is kind of its own package. Nothing jumps out at you. Uh, people often call it kind of the the mild mannered, uh, mild mannered gentleman mm -hmm. of of sake yeast. It's going to produce. Uh, that kind of, you know, that beautiful round kind of spiderweb graph that they use you know, to show whether a product is good or bad in one area yeah. or another. Number seven tr produces great balance around the graph. Mm. So it produces enough acidity, and you can push acidity if you want to. It produces enough of the back flavors of bitter and astringency to help support a more sweet character on the front end, for example. Um, so it has that characteristic, and anybody who tastes it can go, oh, I think that might be number seven, because it's not overbearing in its aromas, and it gives me great balance, and, and sort of it's pleasant throughout the palate. Yeah, it's interesting, because yeah. it, it is so subtle, but it's at the same time so defined that it is something that yeah, even you, with you a reasonable of. experience can generally pick it out in a lot mm -hmm. of sense, but it's not but it's non overbearingness is really right. part of its yeah. you're not appeal. picking it out because it's shouting at you exactly yeah. and the other thing about number seven that's more from the maker side of things uh it it's so robust in its way of fermenting that you don't have to coddle it you don't have to treat it so nicely it's not a prima donna <laughs> um and it works well in different environments i mean they use it everywhere and it seems to get along pretty well everywhere it does well at higher temperatures. There are some places that basically deal with higher temperature fermentations, and it does well there. It does well at low temperature fermentation. Um, you can push it around a bit, and it doesn't get cantankerous and stop working or anything like that. So it is, in that sense, a real workhorse um, yeast. Uh, it will work for you pretty much wherever you are. And so being the, the home of Magical Number no. 7, in your products or in oh, your yeah. different things that you make, yeah. number seven doesn't make up right. a massive percentage of the different sake that you're producing. Right, right. I mean, we we do talk about the story, especially at when you're at that sort of second level of sake knowledge and interest, and it's okay to talk about microbes without scaring you away. <laughs> um, That's right. This, this is a microbe-friendly <laughs> podcast. So. But but in our own product line, w it's used uh, for tic particular types of products because it works really well and expresses what we want to express in that product. Uh, so it's a selection that we make. And again, this is partly um, the marketing side. Our president is not a brewer. He's not a trained brewer. So he's on the business and marketing side. And so from that side, um, there are certain products that need to have certain characteristics, and number seven is the go-to yeast for those characteristics. But there are other types of sake that we also want to show that uh, we can make very well, and you really need to choose a different type of yeast to get, for example, something with a lot of bright fruit. You want something that's uh, a fruit bomb, basically. Uh, if you're going to do a super fresh Nama style, maybe Nama Genshu, you're not going to touch it up at all, you're not going to dilute it, you're not going to filter it, something like that. A lot of times you're going to choose to increase that intensity by using a yeast that has more intense um, esters and so on. So yeah, that's just, it's part of choosing sakes that fit our aim and fit the market's um, needs. And so we were talking a little bit earlier about that sort of local driven uh, uh -huh. taste of the market sort, yeah. of, sort of shifting that way. Uh, as well as the challenges and differentiation mm -hmm. for on mm. the consumer exactly, side. Exactly. Yeah, and so yeah, when you start looking at that. It can that, be more of an issue now. Right. For and sure. so looking, at sort of, re, are you re-examining seven at all? I oh mean, yeah, seven is, is a micro, yeah. as, you, as you said, it's difficult to communicate. It's not at that real surface mm -hmm. level. But that being yeah. said, that's something that is culturally has had a massive impact mm -hmm. and is something that is a asset of Masami that can't be taken away. That's and very so true. A lot of and, that. and you're right. The last several years, because of the um, the changes in the sake, sake market, and again, this is mostly in Japan, yeah. um, everybody's been trying to find new ways to differentiate themselves. And one of the ways is to talk about you know, the special points of your own history. The fact that number seven yeast 
was designated at Masumi and has become such a successful you know, microbe is something that we do talk about. And we have shifted our production more toward number seven. A lot more of our products are now using number seven than before. And that's partly because that helps us keep our story a bit special from all the other great makers out there. Uh, and that's gonna increase in the future for sure. But the other thing is we've noticed a change in the sakes that people seem to enjoy in the market. Um, obviously there are always going to be new people who've never had sake before that will always enjoy a very fruity, very bright, intense sake that's easy to understand. So clearly there's always a place for that style of sake, which is not the style that number seven um, generally makes. But more and more people are going toward, for example, sakes that are really set up for food, food pairing, having with your meal, whatever it is. And that means you're going to want a little bit higher level of acidity and you're going to want to kind of tone down the aromatic quality and try to get the aromatics and the palate to fit together better. And number seven has enough flexibility in its characteristic that if you say change the temperature or change the mix um, during fermentation, you can get some very interesting variations just with number seven that fit that fit what the consumer wants now. They want more acidity, something that works with the food, uh, and they've kind of made that extra step. They're, they're no longer beginners, and we're seeing that number seven has more roles to play than it did, I'd say, 10 years ago. Uh, it, it, so we're, we're kind of moving back toward number seven for that reason, too. Not just because it's our own story, but because it seems like there's more opportunity in the market for products that are like number seven. And finally, I just have to put this as a personal point. Please do. The Miyasaka family and the people that live in our area of Nagano generally like the ki kind of sake that number seven produces, meaning not too fruity, not incredibly bright, not incredibly intense. They like sake that's earthier, quieter, uh, it fits into whatever you're having. You don't have to obsess too much about every little thing about your meal and oh my, should I get this sake or that sake and so on. Um, so it, it's sort of the sake that we've always wanted to make anyway. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Very nice. And into that, I know that, I believe I, you told, uh, talked to me a little bit about this before, but your uh, nanago, yeah. Do my daigin jo. Oh, right. The, the product called Nanago. Yeah. Called Nanago. Yeah. So for listen, Nanago literally is number seven. Exactly. Right? Yep. Number uh, seven. Um, is a big performer overseas. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, I remember that well. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, and we were speaking with Natsuki earlier as well, too, about London in the UK. Okay. And I remember yeah. you telling me before that um, a rather renowned restaurant <laughs> is a longtime heavy user yeah. of Nanago. The Fat Duck. Yeah. Yeah, the Fat Duck. That's uh, actually, it's, I think it's his first restaurant, Heston Blumenthal. Yeah. And I think it, it was at least the first restaurant that really made him, you know, the, the, the celebrity chef that he became. And the Fat Duck, uh, I mean, they've, they, they took a, a year or two off or they went somewhere else and reformed and so on. But they've basically been in the market and doing the Fat Duck thing for, for years now. And yeah. we were so happy to have our Nanago Jumai Daginjo um, selected as one of the drinks on their basically paired menu. Um, it's been a mainstay for quite a while. Oh, yeah. When they, when they first selected it, we were happy to have anything in there because, it's, uh, as you know, I mean, Fat Duck is a very innovative, very um, chef-driven restaurant. It doesn't have a Japanese theme at all. And it was the world's number one restaurant in that Pellegrino that list of award list of yeah, award list thing magnificent for restaurants several years yep. running and the reason they selected it was was partly th they have a great sommelier um, Isabel mm -hmm. and he he was the world um, the uh, European uh, champion sommelier um, several years ago and he had a personal interest in sake had been tasting sake had been uh, trying to learn about it and so when Heston said that he wanted to have a sake involved with it, and this is something, I mean, again, this is rare. The chef is talking to his sommelier about having sake included on the pairing menu. 
that kind was, of ideal. Yeah, that's <laughs> ideal. That doesn't happen a lot outside of the Japanese restaurant world, yeah. but but it did happen with these two. And Isa went through a lot of sakes, and he he found Nanago to be the one that worked best with the dish uh, that Hessen was planning for it. And and if it works, and if you understand that it's a restaurant where you you have to wait several months to get a reservation. And it's not a la carte. You don't kind of look at a menu and look through the drink section and pick and choose here and there. It's you sit down and they start serving you. <laughs> and the wines and, and the food is all sort of their production. It's yeah. their performance. And one dish comes out with Nanago faithfully. has been, oh, 15 years now. Wow. Uh, even now, uh, continues to be the sake for that dish. The Sounds of the Sea. Lovely dish. Mm. And... Even now, I mean, re restaurants in London now, there's great Japanese restaurants, there's a lot of fusion restaurants, there's a lot of sake stuff happening in London. The single biggest customer for that product is Fat Duck. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, uh, it, yeah, it's one of those. to have an ambassador like that. Exactly. For you. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and we, of course, we, we thank, uh, you know, we thank Isa and, and, and Mr. Blumenthal himself for, for making those choices, but, but having, having sake in that sort of place gives all of us hope that you know over time more restaurants that have nothing to do with Japanese food culture itself understand how well sake works with what they are um, focused on so Keith I lied I told you I was gonna have you out of here about five minutes before it actually is right now oh so, okay wow <laughs> um, I, I say you're you're so brilliant at <laughs> communicating and sharing all these stories it's been I'm horrible at watching pleasure. the time it's been, <laughs> as am i so we're not a, we're not the best team in that in the in that regard but i want to thank you so much for taking the time to come in is there any last message or anything you want to share with the uh, um, really no just thank you so much justin and sebastian uh, for having me in it was a great session i hope to come back sometime you can Always never say back. enough about sake, especially if you're drinking it. So right. I said, we'll have to do that next time. We're <laughs> in a bit of a... a usually we do. <laughs> right, usually we do. We're in a bit more of a makeshift setup today because it was kind of spontaneous. But uh, right. if you come back again, we'll take good care of you. Great. As long as you bring the masumi. Looking forward to it. Right. Cheers. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. And there you have it. Another episode of Sake on Air. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to send those to us at questions at sakeonair.com. Inquiries have been trickling in over the past few months, so once we collect a mass of diverse questions, we'll, I think we'll go ahead and dig in and do a big listener mail episode somewhere down the road here. So please do keep those coming. And for those keeping tabs on these social networks, you can find us at, at sakeonair on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We will finally be getting some action here on YouTube very shortly. This episode, as all episodes, has been made possible with the outstanding support of the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association. Thanks so much for sticking with us to the end here. We will have plenty of more sake stories headed your way very, very soon. Until then, kanpai!